Today we're going to talk about um, the robot gaze. And the gaze itself, of course, is an enormous topic and a fascinating topic that has emerged in many different forms throughout the 20th and now 21st century discourses of philosophy, psychoanalysis, cultural studies, cultural theory. Um, why are you so interested in the gaze? Mm. I guess there's a type of active agent, which a robot, a social robot, um, comes into the room and demands or requests your attention through a gaze. And some robots are able to actually choose an individual in the room as the primary interactant and mm. to focus their gaze onto the subject. Um, so, for example, the pepper robot will move around and move its head and its eyes so that you and, and even indicate in the colour of its eyes that the fact that it's met your eyes. And so there's something peculiar about that's different from um, your gaze onto a computer screen. You could say a computer screen actually kind of does look back at you mm. and it monitors you through the movements that you make with the mouse. Mm. Um, and so there's an exchange of gazes mm. um, with a computer, but you're in command. So it's more like an embodiment relation to you move the mouse and the mouse moves on the screen and it, you're... You, uh, you interpret things on the screen, you click on the OK button um, to dismiss a dialogue box and perform an action. But a robot is more inscrutable. Um, it doesn't really give, uh, give away or give off very much. Um, some robots, in fact more than Pepper, um, do have facial expression changes. Um, or what they what the roboticists refer to as emotion generation. Um, so they offer themselves to your gaze um, and express supposedly an internal state. But again, what's interesting about that is whereas a lot of what you see on a computer screen is digital, and I mean I mean that in the way that writing is digital, where there's discrete, discrete codes, whereas a facial expression is um, to do with movement and um, deformation of the face mm. um, that doesn't refer to discrete codes at all. Mm. So in all what that means is that the robot doesn't communicate in the same way as other types of artefacts. And so in um, Don Ide's terms, it presents itself in alterity relations. It is an other. And that's where Sartre, talking about the gaze, one of the first really pieces on the gaze, um, said that the gaze of the other is not accessible to you except in the sense of shame that you feel when you're confronted by the gaze. And for him, the gaze wasn't just eyes, it wasn't just ocular. Um, it could be just the rustle of leaves or the brief opening of a shutter. And, and funny, he kind of uses the shutter, and I think he meant in a window, but it could be in a photographic shutter. Mm. Um, so when the robot is looking at you and you can't actually work out the meaning that the robot is making, you do feel a sense of shame or exposure. Um, and that comes from that not being aware. Um, and the roboticist is actually in a position, the designer or programmer or remote operator is in a position where they actually do inhabit that gaze. Um, they're able to transfer the gaze um, into the robot's, look through the robot's eyes. Um, but for the interactant, um, there's a power dynamic uh, 
where the roboticist or the operator is privileged um, in the same way that a photographer is privileged to frame you in a certain way, to focus in a particular way. Um, Before we go on, let's yeah. talk a little more about the gaze itself and how we are defining it. As you said before, the gaze is not just an ocular process. It's really a, a way of relating, perhaps, a, an attitudinal uh, response as well, isn't it, mm. that could capture the nature of the gaze. How, how, how would you define it? Yeah. I mean, I think of it almost as a force field mm. <laughs> um, that imposes constraints on... So you catch yourself... Um, you become self-conscious um, in the gaze. And for someone like Lacan, it is a deep kind of psychological um, um, anxiety, um, castra fear of castration, mm. that you're actually produced as a subject through the gaze. And that gaze is not just... That gaze is actually kind of constant... Um, in yeah so and and it is a way in which you your interiority becomes public and that creates um an anxiety but at the same time there's also that sense of one's own gaze being voyeuristic um scopophilic um the pleasure at gazing at the other, but also that sense of being exposed as a voyeur is even more intense as an experience in, the, in that kind of force field. And that's where actually it relates to some work that you've done, mm -hmm. which is the gaze tracking mm -hmm. um, apparatus that takes what is the intimate or the personal um, all you do signal your eye, uh, gaze direction um, just from where your eyes are, but with the face track, with the um, eye tracking uh, mm. hardware, that gaze is actually revealed. And what did you find with the research subjects that you had in art galleries looking at? Well, what's interesting to me is that the nature of the gaze is often theorized, but the actual practice of the gaze is uh, rarely described or indeed theorized from a practice perspective. So it's fascinating to see how um, what uh, David Simon, the phenomenologist, describes as body routines are enacted. And um, in the study I think you're referring to, we were looking at the gaze in arts museums and the way in which people um, move through and engage visually with artworks, uh, primarily, but not only artworks, with interpretive signage, with other visitors, with their own devices, and a whole host of other things, including the um, architectural spaces of the museum. Mm. But what remains inaccessible through these studies of the case, however um, precise these machines uh, can uh, render the gaze is, of course, the, as you were describing before, the interiority, the interior experience. We don't know what the person is feeling or thinking as they observe, unless, as we do, we conduct interviews afterwards and then you can get some access. However, um, one of the interesting things about very detailed studies of the gaze like this is that you can record unconscious behaviors. So things like fixations, the ways in, in which the eyes dwell, however briefly, in terms of milliseconds. Mm. Fixations uh, become longer, either because one is particularly interested in uh, an object, or because uh, it involves increased cognitive processing. Mm. Uh, and typically, for example, uh, label reading uh, mm. is associated with much longer fixations than non-label reading, presumably because the act of reading is more requires more cognitive uh, load than, than other activities. So, yeah, I'm fascinated by the way in which we can look at behaviors as 
practices as body routines. And of course, uh, humans are moving bodies. The eyes are constantly in motion on heads that are in motion, on bodies in motion that are moving through spaces. Mm. Yeah. 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 And that's where the robotic eye, I think, is interesting because it's a very sanitized eye mm. that denies that gets exposed when you take when you pull the skin off a robot mm -hmm. or when you start to disassemble the robot then suddenly it appears like a kind of um a, a puppet that's mm -hmm. that's um broken apart in some way so in heidegger's terms it becomes present at hand mm -hmm. and that transition from the readiness to hand of liveliness um goes away and if you think back to some movies, some science fiction movies, uh, in The Terminator, Arnie extracts his sort of damaged eye, drops it into the sink. Um, so the eye becomes abjected. Um, or in Blade Runner, uh, when the um, replicants go into the um, eye manufacturer, um, who's using chopsticks in that in the sort of very stereotypical um, Asian um, microsurgeon mm -hmm. um, to, um, to play with eyes as components that are, are, are reproduced. And so in some way, in the cultural imaginary, the eye is this objected thing, um, but that is denied in the very carefully designed um, robot eyes. There's um, Garner Holt has a Abraham Lincoln uh, robot, or um, Hiroshi Ishiguro creates robot has created a robot of himself and of his um, of a Danish um, roboticist as well, and a bunch of other um, and the fact that the eyes can blink. Um, and if you go back to the early history of animation um, and even cinema, um, blinking is quite an important indicator of uh, life when the eye actually stops looking for one mm. fraction of a second. Yes, and, and the blink, of course, is an indicator often of the humanity of the other. Uh, mm. And the absence of the blink is, is associated mm. with the machine. I did a, a project with... Um, David Silvera Tawil at um, UNSW, in which we introduced our um, experimental subjects to the street uh, in Oxford Street, busy shopping street uh, in Paddington. And we said to them, it's possible that uh, one of or more of the passers by or drivers, pedestrians, cyclists here may be a robot. If you uh, believe you've seen one, please just make a note of it and let us know afterwards. And they were at the time wearing eye trackers, our subjects. And it was fascinating how having put this suggestion into people's minds, they actually began to see robots, <laughs> um, androids in, in the street. And one of the signs that they gave was that uh, somebody hadn't been blinking, they felt enough. And this yeah. was possibly a sign. And what was very interesting was it introduced to them, it's an instant uncanny experience mm. and it, uh, many people found it deeply disturbing to think that the robots might be amongst mm. us with mm. whatever gaze they might have. So I think that's also interesting, isn't it, the, the notion of the uncanny mm. and particularly with respect to the gaze. We know about the, the uncanny valley when mm. the robot uh, approximates but does not quite achieve um, uh, the appearance of uh, the human and it w is the most intense form of the uncanny. And that, uh, I guess, is centered on the gaze itself, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, it's interesting, some of the latest um, video or image synthesis technology mm -hmm. or face um, mm -hmm. construct, the software that constructs a face, mm -hmm. um, I think almost gets beyond that uncanny valley mm -hmm. to the point where it's quite comfortable to look at um, these mm. um, robotic uh, faces. Although, yeah, 
it depends. I think if it, if it sort of performs, but once you start examining it, mm. um, so if, if you there's an app on your phone that you can use to actually capture a photo of yourself mm -hmm. and um, it will construct an avatar mm. um, and then you can dress yourself and my wife turned me into a woman and put <laughs> me into a dress. We need to see this. So, yeah. It's, yeah, I, I, the, the paper actually that David and I wrote was called Beyond the Uncanny Valley. Mm -hmm. And it was dealing with that situation, arguing that when it is impossible to tell the difference between the android and the human, mm. that is even more disturbing in mm. a sense, because um, one lives in a constant state of radical doubt. Is this or is this not a human? Mm. And therefore, what is the quality of the gaze? Which raises for me a very interesting question, uh, which you um, alluded to in your reference to Sartre and his, his shutters and the rust of leaves. Uh, and that is, can the gaze, and I think it can, be present in the other than human, uh, in, mm. in objects themselves, and in, in, a, in a world of design, where we're constantly interacting with designs, both digital and, and non, and objects more generally. What is the role for you of the gaze in that context? Mm -hmm. Because it seems to me that in traditional societies, uh, the notion of the inanimate, the quote unquote inanimate, having a gaze, the animated gaze is everywhere. Mm -hmm. And you know, rocks and trees. Yeah. Well, God sees, it. God sees everything. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I guess what's happened in the past 50 years is that that sense of being gazed upon has actually been manifest. Mm. So um, mm. we carry around a device in our pocket mm. which gazes at where we are in space with the GPS. Um, and so that can actually be presented in evidence that mm. you can um, see that where you made a phone call um, is from a particular spot or where you took a photograph mm. at a particular place and time. Yeah. Um, so there's a, 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 an actual gaze upon you, um, security cameras, yeah. um, the, you know, what Foucault famously called the panoptic gaze mm. of discipline. Mm. But Deleuze really referred to that we've gone beyond discipline mm. into control right. uh, where we actually do have, I mean, in a way the, um, the swipe card um, mm. is also a way in which you are seen mm. by the doorway that allows you to enter yeah. um, and that, could literally be, um, you know, face recognition or, and in China, certainly the use of face recognition systems um, means that you are literally, like it's better than the 1984 mm. telescreen, mm. Um, that it's, you might be gazed upon by the state, uh, even if you step out into the road when the crossing light is not lit, um, in some intersections, there's a large screen um, that shames you on the spot that says, you know, hey, Chris Cheshire, mm. you're crossing the road illegally. Um, and everyone on the street can see, can see that. And maybe you have your social credit reduced as mm. a result of that. And so case. you should. Yeah, I mean, the nearest thing I've seen to that here, of course, is uh, occasionally where roadworks uh, mm. are underway. Mm. You get uh, road signs that monitor your speed and then yep. then give you a smiley if you were under. Or <laughs> I'm not sure what they do when you go over. They, yeah. they shame you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all of these gazes, though, presuppose that behind the machine gaze is a human gaze at some point, mm. which is um, making the decision in the case that you've just described to, to uh, value behavior or devalue behavior in particular mm. kinds of ways to judge. Mm. So there's mm. a human judgment there. Mm. Whereas of course in the traditional societies we were talking about before, uh, 
um, the, there is not, no assumption that there is a human behind that. The tree itself is, yeah. uh, has, has personhood, mm. let's say. And I, I think maybe it's a question of, of personhood mm. that it becomes interesting here, isn't yeah. it? To, in that there's some sort of agency yeah. behind the gaze, and it's the nature of that agency which is critical. Yeah, yeah. I, and I think that's where robotic gaze is interesting because it is what the roboticists are trying to design towards mm. is to have uh, an interaction that's not just a kind of mirroring. So when you use an animoji, for example, mm. on your phone, and you see yourself as an elephant or as a mm -hmm. turd um, and animate yourself, you are in control of that and you right. see yourself. Whereas a robot that has both emotional um, recognition mm -hmm. and emotion generation will say, you're looking sad today, Chris. Mm. Um, what's upsetting you? Mm. Um, and actually respond in a way that there is no human in the loop, mm. um, but it is operating as an emotional other and there's like an intersubjective dynamic in play. Um, and the roboticists actually find that it doesn't take a lot to give people a sense of that intersubjective dynamic of, of, of feeling that it comes easily. Yes, we're into new territory now, I think, mm. with this. And presumably we're at the very beginning of mm. a revolution in the way we respond to things mm. and we relate to them. Yeah. And it's the, the simulation of emotion, I suppose, that is going yeah. to become increasingly difficult to distinguish between you know, mm. fake mm. and authentic. What is yeah. authentic emotion? Yeah, when yeah. machines are producing it. Yeah, yeah, and that's where there's different strategies um, mm -hmm. between the ultra-realistic robot on the one mm. hand, which does immediately create that sense of the possibility mm. of the, the robot being indistinguishable, mm -hmm. um, and that's what you know Blade Runner plays with. At least um, the androids. The androids, mm. yeah. Um, that's what Ex Machina plays with, mm -hmm. um, and that sort of sense of testing yeah. the the possibilities of mm -hmm. um, being fooled. Um, but on the other hand, there are robots whose faces are just um, kind of geometrical shapes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the um, eye eyelids that that sort of operate like shutters and mm. eyebrows that move up and down. You can see the mechanisms. Mm. But in that case, the roboticists think of facial expressions as a kind of universal language. Mm. And they think that there's some kind of platonic ideal mm. of the facial expression that says, this is disgust, this is surprise. Mm. Um, this is as though there was a repertoire of universal expressions. Mm -hmm. I mean, the problem I have with that is that the expression of could be you've just won the lottery yeah. or it could be that your friend just died. Um, the same expression of surprise could be, mm. um, yeah, yeah, so. Yeah. And so you actually require kind of narrative or um, background to really understand and whether a robot is sufficiently sophisticated and, and you know, basically AI is nowhere near um, being able to understand mm. the context of that case. Not, not yet, but I'm sure things will change. And, and of course we, we are, humans are naturally prone to interpreting emotion in the inanimate. So you look mm. at, you know, a car or a truck mm. and its headlights immediately appear like eyes and mm. its radiators, the mouth and so on. So we attribute emotion very easily, I think, mm. to face-like mm. and eye-like um, structure, and particularly the eyes, of course, which immediately yeah. attract our own gaze because yeah. it's a, a primary survival strategy. You, yeah. It's the, the, the 
in all of our eye tracking studies, uh, it, it's, it's very well established that if you want to attract attention, you put some eyes in an image, and that's mm. what we will look at. It'll be yeah. the first fixation yeah. will fall on the eyes yeah. because they're a source of danger potentially. I think that's yeah. why they're so attractive. Mm. Yeah, and there is that distinction between that uh, Chris and Van Leeuwen make between a photograph of a person who's looking at you mm -hmm. Um, and person who's looking away, yes. and they say that the person looking at you is making a demand, right. whereas the person looking away is making an offer. Yes, it's interesting um, that that analysis, and it's often used um, in uh, graphic design to direct the gaze. So, wh whereas the gaze, where eye contact is made, the the um, the form of the direct form of address you connect with the eyes, but when you're looking away, you follow the gaze. So if you want to direct attention mm. across in a graphic design, mm. have somebody looking at something mm. and the viewer will look at whatever it is that's being mm. looked at. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, and that also relates to Laura Mulvey's concept of the male gaze. Um, so in cinema, mm. she talks about the fact that in, in the dominant cinema, mm. there's actually three types of um, gaze going on. Uh, there's a gaze of the camera in the pro-filmic event, so the camera itself has a gaze. Then the audience is gazing at the screen in the dark and um, being positioned as a voyeur. And then the gaze of the characters in the film. And she says that the, um, the first two are kind of disavowed or hidden whereas the gaze of the characters um, to give the reality to the characters. Um, and she says that the camera has the position of the male gaze. Um, this is well known. <laughs> yeah, the, ge the gendered gaze of, of cinema and the way in which um, the French um, theorist of cinema, Jean-Luc uh, Baudry, talks about the way in which the cinema itself is a, a, a offers a potential merging of the viewer with the, the scene, a kind of return, he argues, to the womb, mm. which I find a little um, hard to tell. <laughs> it depends on the nature of what's going on, yeah. I think, on screen, uh, which he seems yeah. to... And that's where John Ellis's work is um, particularly interesting in this mm. before, and I've used his mm -hmm. work, um, because he distinguishes between the gaze of in cinema mm -hmm. and what he calls the glance of mm -hmm. television. Mm -hmm. And in cinema, you're sitting in a public darkened space mm -hmm. with other people mm -hmm. where the screen is much bigger than you mm -hmm. and you are prepared for it mm -hmm. by a kind of narrative image of, um, of, of you understand the genre of the film um, and you're presented with... Um, yeah, so it positions you in a certain gaze mm -hmm. relationship that relates to Mulvey's one. But with television, that's just a piece of furniture in your house mm -hmm. that you can move away from, move in and out. He says that sound is important for keeping people... Um, and this was really before. He was writing before the large screen televisions mm -hmm. and home theatre, mm -hmm. which I think can actually produce a more of a gaze relationship. But the dominant one is the glance. And he says that what um, television offers is a look onto the bizarre world outside from the safety of the domestic space. Mm -hmm. So the world presents the, um, the, um, the, the, the shows that show reality TV, so Survivor and mm -hmm. people doing bizarre acts mm -hmm. or... Um, yeah, but I actually sort of extended that and thought, okay, so we've got the gaze for cinema, we've got the glance for TV, but what is the relationship between the console game player and the game screen? Mm. And I said it's not the gaze or the glance, it's the glaze. So the glaze mm. um, is also in a domestic space, but where is the glance and the gaze have multiple people who are dressed in the same way. Mm. The video game is addressed 
first to the person with the controller in their hand. Mm -hmm. So the, the glaze actually sticks or attaches. It has a holding power. And um, mm -hmm. Sherry Turkle actually talked about the holding power of video games. Mm -hmm. So there's a stickiness to the glaze yeah. that holds you. Um, and there's what I refer to as ludostatic mechanisms, which is that the, there's a sort of, um, is it Snow White? Who does the, who does the, um, it's, oh, that's the three, three bears. The either, it's not too hot, okay. not too cold. It's just right. Goldilocks. Goldilocks, mm. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> getting my, getting my. Yeah, um, characters, right. Yeah. Um, so it, it, with a, a game that's too difficult, yeah. you feel alienated from it. Um, if it's too easy, you there, you have no investment in it. Right. Um, whereas if it regulates your attention yeah. and your control and your affect, mm. um, you'll continue to play, to be situated yeah. within the glaze. Yeah. So sort of managing the reward, uh, uh, yeah. a sufficient yeah. amount of yeah. reward. Uh, that, and that, I suppose, brings us on to the, the nature of attention, capture and control, because we live in an economy of attention mm -hmm. where perhaps the most valuable of all contemporary commodities is attention. Mm -hmm. And all sorts of different agencies uh, vie for it, from governments to advertisers of various kinds to um, individuals. Mm -hmm. And it has a huge amount of value, doesn't it? Mm. And, and attention capture mm. requires those eyes on the screen. Yeah, and there's a kind of metonymic relationship to the way that the eye works, mm -hmm. which is that you just have in the macula, you have the central area with mm. um, the most concentration. So there's actually, in the connection to the brain itself, mm. um, attention is is associated with, and particularly not for blind people, mm -hmm. and that's um, for people who are blind, there's different types of attention. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, but in, um, yeah, I guess that also relates to the dimension of consciousness itself. Mm -hmm. What do you mean? Um, that, I mean, you, um, Freud used the analogy of the magical tablet. So when you're a child, you have the piece of wax tablet with the, cell the celluloid on top of it. Mm. And you can use a stylus to write on that. And he says that that's like consciousness, um, which only holds the image for a certain duration before you lift the celluloid mm. and um, everything disappears from consciousness. Um, so it, attention is about becoming conscious. Mm. But then he says that there's a deeper impression. And I guess this is what advertising tries to do. Mm. Um, it, it tries to draw your attention, mm. but also then create the impression on the wax that's, uh, that is difficult to detect until you you get exposed to the brand or to your gaze falls upon the in the supermarket you suddenly see the brand of washing powder that you see and advertised and snap yeah. um, it comes into consciousness again and you have that desire to purchase and and ideally from the advertiser's point of view it triggers a behavior mm. And mm. the hand reaches out and you put it in your trolley. Yeah. And I think this, this re brings us back to the notion that the, the gaze, which, of course, in uh, traditional forms of aesthetics is seen as disembodied, disinterested, mm. is, of course, profoundly embodied. It can't be anything but embodied. Mm. And it's associated with certain types of behaviors which are preferred or dispreferred, depending on the situation and the actors. Mm. And so in the case of of advertising, 
the gaze is the starting point for triggering certain kinds of preferred behaviors from the advertiser's perspective. Mm -hmm. And perhaps also, and I think interestingly, um, when we bring us back to the robots, about what is not gazed on. So, you know, it's look here, but don't look there. Mm -hmm. And there are certain things that the gaze is actively um, stopped from, mm. from looking at. Yeah. And that's where a lot of roboticists use what they call a Wizard of Oz mm -hmm. uh, experiment. So they have an operator hiding around the corner mm -hmm. um, and controlling the robot, but giving the impression that the robot is actually more intelligent than it actually is. Mm -hmm. um, and so people do respond and, and people are credulous enough that the robotic technology and artificial in intelligence technology has a sort of mystical mm -hmm. dimension to it that people will believe that the robot is intelligent, even from even from minor signs, mm -hmm. um, and particularly from that Wizard of Oz relationship. Um, people are, want to believe. Yes, they do. Mm. Again, uh, with um, David Silvera Tower, uh, we did a, another um, experiment in which we placed one of those, uh, an Android robot in a laboratory and alongside the Android we, we sat a, a human model dressed uh, in the same way as the robot and behaving in a similar way to the robot and our subjects were introduced uh, to them very briefly, they, they were, the robots were, and the human was hidden behind a screen and we then asked the subjects, with a, they had a five second opportunity to look um, are you looking at one robot, two robots, or two humans, and which is which? And uh, it was amazing how confused people actually got by this. And um, it was not so much the gaze at all that uh, was the distinguishing element, but it was the, the sight of breathing quite often, or the rising and falling of the chest. Mm, mm. A glimpse. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um. Great. Well, we've we've covered, I think, pretty much all of the points yep. on here. Is yep. there anything you'd like to add in terms of? Um, I thought I might just embellish a little bit on the mm. glaze because. Yes. So we, tell tell us about the glaze. Tell yep. us more about. It. So as well as um, addressing the player as the individual, mm. and it's also. It's also possible to, to, the, that um, gaming is actually a spectator sport, um, but that, and that's where um, the gamer's elite gaze becomes part of the um, part of the spectacle. Um, the fact mm. that, that that there's an implied the, the implied gaze, and that's um, or. In, a shared glaze, by, by being immersed in the glaze. And that's where, in that horrible sense of the Christchurch uh, shooter, um, where he actually made himself into a, a video game character mm. um, and, and you know, entered the mosque um, as an assassin um, that looked a lot like a, um, a game. Um, there's a, but in gameplay, and I don't want to link the two two directly, um, but in gameplay there's a kind of a sadomasochistic dimension to gameplay where there's an enjoyment of shooting other characters, but there's also a pleasure at the point of death of your character when, and typically what happens with the, de with the death is that you're moving around you're in control and you have a sensory motor connection with the avatar in the game space. Um, so you move the joystick left and the viewpoint goes left, the, the, the sort of angelic camera over the shoulder um, follows you. Um, you are the center of the universe. Um, and, but when you're killed, usually the screen changes colour mm. and you're 
controls become unresponsive and the camera moves off in a totally different direction um, and the screen goes black, but suddenly you are resurrected. Um, and so there's a, 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 a challenge to move on. Mm. Um, and in um, cinema, cinema is kind of a nostalgic um, medium. Yeah. Um, television is more of a um, sort of distracted complicity with the world. You agree with what's going on, but usually it um, disappears and the next series mm. comes up. Yeah. Um, whereas with um, a game, it's a possible world. What can I do here? How can I act? What, what is possible? Mm. Mm. Uh, of course, you draw attention by choosing the word glaze to the notion of glazing over, which is a kind of a state of mm. catato mild catatonia, mm. isn't it? So uh, are we not at a broader cultural level all increasingly subject to this glazed yep. effect? Yep. Yeah, and I guess if you get onto a, um, a bus and you see that everybody mm. has their mobile phone um, that they're glazed to, um, I guess, you know, but it used to be the newspaper and um, then there, there is a, a way in which if your gaze is captured by the object that it's not available anymore to interpersonal gaze. And I guess in public space that's sort of a necessary thing is that um, avoiding the gaze um, is one of the ways in which you inhabit urban space. Um, to regulate access to the gaze. Um, but um, the other thing about the glaze in, in um, video games is it's the glaze of a ceramic. I think of you know, a, a red um, vase and if you look closely into it, you can see yourself in the glaze, mm. but you're distorted mm. in some way. So that's where that identification with the player in the game space is another form of reflection of the self. But the, and the central character in a game, like Grand Theft Auto, the Grand Theft Auto series, um, the central character, unlike in film, which is the most developed character, is the least developed character because it is whoever happens to be in control of that avatar um, and I mean it's interesting in a game like Red Dead Redemption 2 you have a sense of actually being party to a gang um, of other characters and the other characters actually get developed and they start projecting onto you a certain character so there's a way in which the game writes your and actually requires of you a certain type of action. So even if you don't really feel like killing all those people or blowing up the train or whatever, um, if you are invested in the game, your subjectivity in play is constituted by the mission of the game. Um, and again, that attaches you to the game in a particular way. And of course, you, you are the person who introduced me to Red Dead Redemption 2 mm -hmm. uh, in a, a few months ago, in an exciting evening of death and destruction. <laughs> uh, and I, I guess maybe this is a good point for us to, to wrap it, but it does uh, inevitably introduce the glaze and the end of a certain kind of interpersonal relationship. And I think it would be really interesting to, um, perhaps in our next conversation, to, to look at the ways in which the, the digital cultures can actually promote interpersonal gaze as opposed to glaze. Mm -hmm. Yep, I think that'd be good. Mm. Thank you. Should we go and get some lunch? I think so. That would yeah. be excellent. Yeah, thank you. That was a great... Uh, have Good. we covered everything? Yeah. I think so. That'll be a nice yeah. collection of... Um,
comments. Great. Yeah. That would be beautiful. I could play this to the students. All right. Well, that's a wrap, as Good. they say. Thanks. <laughs>